thank you for being here. I'd, I'd like to begin actually with the, the title poem. I'll be predictable, scanning for tigers. Scanning for tigers. The problem, the optometrist said, lies with print. Eyes were never meant to read, but to scan for tigers. To scan for tigers at a distance, shift to a close-up of one arm, where a fallen insect uncurls, walks among hairs. Back again to distance, alert for stripes among the foliage, mindful of shadows among the shadows, conspiracies of light. The eyes, he said, were meant for roaming, the eyes were meant for wildness. Print in its ant parade tyrannizes. You can never look at a book the way you look at a woman. The woman and the tiger share a sinuous flow that lets the eyes slip by, even as they behold. No grasping ever with the woman or the tiger, though each may imprint upon the retina a memory that devours. At this juncture of history, he said, rare to see the tiger anywhere, but women, well, ambush awaits in many a place. So which is most dangerous? Books also excite and inflame, banned and burned and come to think of it, some women burned too. Blake's tiger ignited him. Every hunter burns. So we're on fire, he said lastly. From all we see, books and men and women turn to ashes in the end. But the tiger remains an ember. I live in Brooklyn. I'm my subway train is the L train. And there was a time in which something was awry with the tracks. And so when the train was coming, it would make this most dissonant and haunting music. And I thought, how will I write about that? Suggested by the subway. L train approaching Bedford Avenue in percussive mode. Here come the impalas leaping madly before the lion, electric and fluid as fright can make them, straining to keep to the air. The doomed women who dance the dance they know cannot save them, beads at their throats, breasts shaking, their feet eloquent in the dust. And after them, the lovers, hands locked with those they chose before this wave swept them. And after them, tumblers and fire eaters dressed in torn silks, the dwarves bearing torches, everyone running, running, and oh, the sound of bamboo bent without mercy before the wind, weird chiming clatter that fetters then freeze the mind. There is a beautiful garden in Huntington, California. It's the Huntington Garden. And it's a series of interlocking gardens. And one of them is an Asian garden in which there is a great stand of bamboo. And when I reached it, I saw that people had come and they had carved their initials and all kinds of messages into this stand of growing bamboo. Bamboo Grove, Huntington Garden, California. The swath they've incised runs four feet deep. When wind blows, crowds of initials click and court in the grove. Place of garden lovers, also the turf of Wanda and Richie, Jack and Stacy forever, spot where John loves Tom. 
No one's taught them bamboos 1,400 uses, nor that some species take 30 years to bloom, some 100. Asian myth reveals that man sprang from the hollow internode, but the story hasn't reached them. They're an army of jackknives. The satin-skinned, the restless, would they not be better off schooled about all the dreadful uses someone waits to put them to? No one's here, though I envision them indolently carving. Someone, risking scorn and shrugs, might tell them what Issa said. Rare luck it is indeed to be born in human form. I am a stranger passing through, arrested by their work. The bamboo ripples, parts its scars to bear the place where none have touched. Wind again. Who bows first, myself or the bamboo? Who at this moment can divide one survivor from the others? If you look in a book like Roger Torrey Peterson's uh, Bird Guide, you'll find under the Red Winged Blackbird call uh, that it's listed as Oakley, that that is the call that you're most likely to hear the bird make. Oakley, if a blackbird. If a blackbird. Wings flare red and cream crescent out of sight, his streaky mate tucked in long grasses. If a blackbird, his ochalee contained in his whistle box, bends stem after stem to bring down moons of phantom, waning dandelions. If a blackbird, help me please, I am repetition and so is he. If a blackbird ducks his pure night head in early morning sun down to a foot also dark to eat the spread of starry seeds, to feast on the bounty of this day. May we take it as a sign to make him magician of every appearance, miraculous and simple. He conjures this arch of blue held by keystone of birdsong, the separate shining welcome from each leaf, each blade of grass. Through him, we inhale lilac, exhale hayfield, as he pulls handkerchief memories, bright-lined through our minds. From his epaulette, tiny strawberries fall to our tranced fingers, that in the grotto of our mouths, we may taste what is wildest. And to us, he transfers his heat sweet coal of summer sun, that our touch might ignite each other to flames upon the cool bed, for he commands our amazing hands and all they may do this day. And if a blackbird at day's end returns to the round of the new nest, open as a mouth at the wonder of the world, if a blackbird who knows nothing of what we are forced to know swallows only the precious moments, starry and single-purposed as seeds, and converts them by way of his song to paradise as he knows it. What should we do but follow him? When he folds his wings upon the flight da Vinci once dreamed, he sways on a reed, tuning up in the hush. A breeze unfolds, he dips and rows with a few notes, liquidly towards twilight. Let us have whatever of him we can possibly manage. Let us strive to loosen our complexities, come to a place still and serene, keeping as best we can within the little clearing of now. Game, I played with my cat for a while. She doesn't play it anymore, but 
a poem came out of it anyway. I used to put her on my desk, cleared, of course, and, and grasp her by the forelegs and, and swing her around, and she loved it. <laughs> and out of it came this, dusting with the cat. Her sinewy self, her mood, allows us our game. I hold her loosely round the ribs, just back of the forelegs. We trace figure eights, and each begets another. Her purring revs, spun by turns into a vocal gleam. She doesn't care that she's a rag, the dust has her. We're locked in the luster of movement, building layers like a pearl. We're drunk on the wine of motion a certain speed achieves. What speed, I cannot say, though the fluent cat does, her song spliced with pauses where the orbits intersect. We're burnishing our years into the surface of my desk, her proverbial nine, my uncertain number. But a swinging cat cares not for count, living for sensation, and a wild woman always believes she has more time. We had a dreadful winter, but this does end with spring, so I'm going to read you this one, even if you shrink and shriek at the word snow seems to have disappeared from the table of contents entirely, just to con <laughs> confound me. Uh, are you not here anymore? It melted, perhaps. <laughs> oh, okay, here we are. There's a shrub called bridal wreath, which is a, grows big and has long, overarching, wonderful, drape, drapey, white blossoms in the, in the spring. Um, and its other name, its more uh, Latin name, its Latin name is Spirea. Spring snow. Wafting upon trees, upon understory, the history of lace making revises itself. You can almost hear the song cycles of swan migration, feathery lyrics exploding against the windshield. And though you're leaving the territory of adornment and erasure, though it ceases in the next county and the one after that, snow paces itself with your breathing, dips and rises in you like the road. The secret, Snow says in your ear, the secret is drifting off. The secret, it says again, fabulous, I forget. The secret, a breathy voice, androgynous but lulling. Would you sully what only spirit knows? Traveling onward, you lose it. But when in May the spirea shakes down its arcing snowfall, when from its branches you pluck a warbler's nest, the size of your heart, touching the lining she made soft, dappled now with petals, the luck you were ever born blossoms into voice. O oh, fallen rice of your parents' wedding, it sings. O oh, remembrance till death. This one is about Icarus. Icarus who flew with his father Daedalus to escape the island where King Minos lived. Um, and Icarus didn't heed the advice of his father. His father said not to fly too high or his wings which the father had made of wax and feathers would melt. So I thought 
I'm a person who's a little bit addicted to watching portions of films run backwards. I've never gotten over my fascination for seeing everything returning to the person's mouth, every action going backwards, people sucked on these miraculous currents into other, you know, those places that they'll come out of again when the film is run forward. So I thought, what if Icarus's existence was run backwards? So even the words of his, uh, the advice of his father here, Daedalus, um, comes out backwards. Icarus in reverse. See me sucked from sea's brine, cry return to my mouth, pulls in proceeding shriek that inhales gas before then there's no more, nor do my wings betray, but pluck treacherous pinions here, there, out of the air, snatched with a marvelous fury. Feathers fly dartwise into wax, bigger quills double secured by thread considered in construction and swift as water winks at sun wax cools to capture shafts as threads manic and precise continue counter lash and not don't stop let me rise tumbling upward to grace gaining back errant feathers that home like arrows to target their bronze boy regaining control there there's the wing beat where first i faltered now I soar swoopily backward, mouth open in glee, dropping altitude till I beat by my father's side, passing on our left Samos and Delos, while on our right Levinthos whizzes by. As below, plowman and shepherd share brief cameos, one pointing, the other leaning on his staff, lest he fall down as we fly snap, snap to the island. See us touch earth, toe to heel. My father unkiss me, untake my face in his hands. Tears run up his cheeks. He says, safe be will you and near me keep. The melt will heat the high to if, and so on. All that he says, lost to the speed slur of the tape that pauses only if you do. Don't pause. Let our efforts be shorn from the footage, clipped till we stand yearning at cliff's edge. You'll sense how time clambers with us in our descent, handhold by foothold, our labors collapsing inward, crazed and intent. I beg you, hurry. Again, Minos imprisons us. Faster, let the thing be done. I prefer this grounding to the flying, prefer my father's anguish to my own dying. And I will end with a different flight. This is called Azure. The Azure, you'll see the Azure here if you observe and look. It's a little smoky blue-gray butterfly that is here in, the, in now actually in May and into June. A very small butterfly very beautiful. Azure. The sky hides a puzzle. You must be a missing bit, dropped by heaven hand to beguile and lead me astray. Where are we going? White violet, you say. Why haven't I lived my life riveted to your flutter. You beat as if you knew my heart, my heart. Memorized every second that ever gave me joy. Where are we going? Old field sink foil, you answer. Yellow, 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 sings a bird intimate with the plan. You rise, dip towards shoreline where the sea enfolds sky. The jut of coast cuffed with stone and sleeved by wild flag in bloom. Was there a thing called winter? Sorrow kite, break string and fly. I am an iris among irises lofting into butterfly. And we are firmly under sail and I have left two feet ashore. Farewell, faithful servants who carried me thus far.
Did your eye doctor really say that? Um, my brother's optometrist uh -huh. said it to him, and uh -huh. we were talking about how tragically expensive glasses were on the phone, and he said to me, well, I've just been to my optometrist, and he said, eyes were never meant to read, but to scan for tigers, and I thought, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that explains everything. Um, and of course, what he meant was that this fixed thing of oh, the I screen know. and the tiny print is not mm -hmm. what the eye was meant right. to do, that the healthiest thing for your eye is a constantly changing yes. distance, and that back in the day when we literally had to scan for tigers or whatever might, might have been, a, or even other people, that it was close up, mid distance, and far away. And it was just too good to resist. Yes. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I did have. Uh, it went through a lot of drafts. I, I, had a, I had a different poem for a long time, uh, but it finally wrestled into the shape that you heard. And, and I kept thinking of the Blake, and you mentioned it like just at the perfect moment. And her? Yeah, yeah he, he crept into the poem late, but <laughs> I, I am... Um, I'm very enamored with him, not only for his poetry, but because also he um, he dealt in visual yeah. stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And I uh, I make collages, oh, which yeah. I think is the natural medium for for poets. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so then Blake got in there. There are a few uh, a few guys from way back who are important to me in the book. Um, mm -hmm. Byron is in there, yeah. and uh, Keats. Yeah, I kept he it's interesting thing because I was going to say that I kept getting glimmers of those poets. Are they romantic? Oh, I am a romantic. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> also, I mean, the, but then there's the the Blackbirds, the Wallace Stevens, the mm -hmm. um, Thirteen Ways. Yeah. 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 So, well, yeah. as you all know, the broader your references are, the more riches you bring to the table. Yes. Uh, yes. So, the more voraciously you read, so you keep. Right. Amassing things, and I, I will say that um, just a book that everyone might enjoy that I think either may, maybe makes life very rich is there's a terrific uh, book called The Dictionary of Symbols, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have absolutely everything, but mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. if you look at it, you, it, it's quite fascinating, and it ranges through different cultures too, mm -hmm. so it, it's wonderful in that way as well. Thank you so much.